So I'm a believer. I am overjoyed. And I'm having a lot of fun. And I think that they are as well. Hello, my fellow TLI colleagues. I hope you're doing well. So I wanted to prepare this video just to give some context about where we are now. We've been at this for about a month. Um, and then to give some uh, guidance on or to kind of situate us where we are presently and then to give some guidance about where we're going forward. So it is March 2nd and we just had our monthly uh, check-in session here on February, I believe it was the 27th on Saturday. And you all provided some really good insights on where you are, what your students are doing, what you've noticed about your instruction and just how metacognition has really elevated the discourse performance and, um, and also enabled you to teach your courses in a much more effective manner. So I'm gonna jump right in and start sharing uh, my slides here. So give me a minute to do that. So I'm gonna start us off where we began. If you remember, I started off defining metacognition for you using Taylor's definition from about <laughs> two decades ago, but it's still one of the better definitions. And I always like to start here because as I told you all before, I think many educators and institutions and students miss out on the full benefit of metacognition because they narrowly define it as thinking about your thinking. And it actually entails significantly more than that, as you'll see in this definition. And so in our short time together, we didn't get a chance to fully delve into the uh, complete impact of the definition, but we did get into these first three lines. So I like to start off with reminding you that metacognition is an appreciation of what one already knows together with a correct apprehension of the learning task and what knowledge and skills it or managing one's learning requires. And so this is a definition that I like to use because it's very applicable to students and it helps educators position their students to really regulate and control their learning. And so here's that definition in visual, uh, and visually laid out. So this is the first part of the definition, what students know, the apprehension of the learning, uh, I'm sorry, appreciation of what one knows. So what does that mean? That means that when students enter a course, they need to get, they need to do a micro assessment of what is it that I know right now about the course on a macro level, but then that also entails what they need to know about any particular topic or concept or new type of uh, article they read? What is it that I know about this now? Metacognitively competent students ask those questions to themselves almost automatically, subconsciously. But then at the same time, they have this unique, valuable capacity to forecast over here on the other side over here and think, uh, what, what, what the definition calls have a correct apprehension of the learning task, meaning a full and, and accurate understanding of what it is I'm supposed to do with this knowledge. So on one hand, what do I know? And on the other hand, what am I supposed to do ultimately with what I need to know? Those two components are, are extremely important for students to be more efficient learners and to be more productive learners. And as you know, I like to call this the productivity gap that every course, every course that students take has in it. And how do you feel that? That's what the third line of the definition, which is with knowledge and skills. So information you give them, students have to be able to use their minds, skills to convert that information into knowledge and you ultimately assess the quality of that knowledge. So I wanted to start us off here just so you get, get uh, I can situate us in that definition and we're gonna see how your work has impacted your own instruction and also how it's impacted students. So jumping right in from the metacognitive checklist, you all remember the checklist that you all filled out that um, just kind of gave you an awareness and, and um, a sort of uh, procedures to follow. So uh, for you to in input metacognition into your classroom. So there's a little data about who we are. Here are some of the courses that you all taught. So I'm gonna move right through this because you can always pause it and go back to it and kind of look at it more closely. And we also went over this on Saturday. I'm just adding a little context to it. So remember we focused on two aspects, planning 
And then also strategy. How do we implement this in the classroom? And so in planning, we looked, we had you all use the good, better, best metacognitive learning outcome rubric. And remember, I emphasize not just learning outcomes, but metacognitive learning outcomes because students need certain ingredients or certain elements in, um, in the course so that they can do the knowledge construction that ultimately all courses require. Meaning, how do I take the information that you're giving me? How do I convert it into what you're gonna be assessing me on? And so metacognitive learning outcomes are highly effective tools. So we spent a significant time on that. And as you can see, most of you did this. Now I should caveat this for some of you who may have not attended Saturday's uh, group session in that some of you filled these surveys out early in January, here we are at the beginning of March, and some of you didn't have students at the time that you filled it out. So you were just kind of thinking through what you were going to do um, as a metacognitive prompt. And so some of these don't reflect what you actually did. So I just wanted to say that up front. Now, the next question, one of the other questions we asked was, have you developed a metacognitive action plan? Fewer of you did that, but I emphasize that a little less. However, the strategy that you use moving forward um, sort of got you using some of these, this metacognitive action plan. I like to call it a map. Strategy, one of the first things we looked at was how to use your syllabus as a tool to help students look at the relationships among the course content, the modes of thinking, and the academic products for uh, the course. And what you're gonna see is when I switch to showing you the students checklist, that your work actually paid dividends because students reported that they saw uh, the links amongst those things in your courses for the first time. And many students just don't see that. And as a result, they flounder throughout the courses. So we had a good amount of participation in that. The next one, I introduced the essential thinking skills within the first week of my course. And remember, this is from uh, research from Kathleen Gabriel's book, uh, Teaching Underprepared Under Students, in which she emphasizes, as I do, the first week it can be really critical in providing your students some of the critical infrastructure that they need to be successful in your course. So you can see a lot of you did that. Great job, excellent work. I avoid outcome confusion by modeling the instruction, in my instruction, the modes of thinking students will encounter on my assessment. So you might remember that outcome confusion, that's the common scenario students find themselves in when, when uh, they don't, they, they can't perform on test. And the way that unfolds just to trigger your memory is whenever you are delivering content, faculty are consciously focused on that content. Students absorb that content consciously, but subconsciously, they also absorb the level of thinking that that content is delivered on. And as a result, whenever they uh, study that content, they continually study it using the same thinking skills upon which it was delivered. Well, then later on, when they're assessed on that on that uh, knowledge, if they have not, um, if the assessment is asking for a different thinking skill, then students get into outcome confusion to where what they the the level of interaction they've had with the material when they study just doesn't match what you're assessing. They get confused. They get frustrated. Sometimes they get mad. And so by doing this, you're uh, you're reducing the likelihood that students are going to engage in outcome confusion. Next part of the strategy we looked at, uh, I will share metacognitive tools I will I use with my students. So great, the tools that you're using, including the diagram behind me, the Think Well, Learn Well diagram, the outcome decoder tool that some of you mentioned that you're using, the compendium of thinking skills is another. It's great that you're using those in the class, but also it's more importantly, it's more important that you're giving that, those tools out to students because ultimately I created those tools so that students can become effective independent learners. And so we have a little work to do there, but again, some of this is reflected because you hadn't seen students yet. And I know from Saturday's conversation that some of you have given this out, it's just not reflected in this early data. This next question says, I provide direct feedback, sorry, direct feedback about students thinking throughout the course. So again, this is just giving students not only the content feedback, here's where, here's the content you missed, here's the topics that you covered in your paper and on, on the test, so on and so forth, 
but here are the levels of thinking that you struggled with, or here's the level, here are the levels of thinking that we really did well with as a, as a class, and here's where we need to develop further. Very important metacognitive feedback for students. And that's where those tools come in handy so that then they can begin to develop the capacity to think at those, those deeper levels. I incorporate low stakes thinking assignments to assess students thinking levels throughout the course. So many of you are doing that, that's excellent. And here's some of your feedback that you mentioned in the survey. Um, I won't talk a lot here because you can pause and read this. But you all said some really good things about um, the question, uh, answering the question of how has, meta, how, how has thinking metacognitively impacted your instruction? Wonderful, wonderful examples. And the next question that you all responded to was, how has using a metacognitive instructional approach impacted your students? And again, some of you hadn't seen students at the time that you uh, that you filled out the survey. So we'll see that reflected on the next survey that you'll, the next uh, time that you'll do this survey checklist. But as you can see, some of you had some really powerful experiences with students. So now let's switch, as you can see, looks similar to the other one, but this is actually the checklist for students. So this is students' responses to the survey. And as you can see, we had 116 respondents and here are the courses again. So let's jump right in. Now with students, we focused on three functions that are critical to academic success from a metacognitive perspective. It's called metacognitive regulation, the ability to plan, monitor, and evaluate your thinking and evaluate your academic work. And so meta, this, this has been shown repeatedly uh, in research to be one of the most effective set of skills that students can have in academic work. And it also shows that these skills also help students in employment as well. And so it's very useful that we're having students develop these skills in a very intentional manner. So planning, I have identified the general thinking skills needed for the course. So you all make, you all introduce the thinking skills. Students have then identified those thinking skills. So remember, our goal is to create this complementary learning environment so that there's symmetry and synergy among the work that you're doing and that students are doing. The next question that students responded to, I have at least one metacognitive tool to help me handle complex thinking. So great, you all are giving them the tools there, as you can see. The next question, I have identified the links amongst the course content, the requisite thinking skills, the course outcomes, and the respective assessments. So that, uni that, that unity amongst those features of your course are critical for students to help them learn much more efficiently and to be more productive in their learning. And so as you can see, a good amount of students are doing that. And so that means that you all are doing a wonderful job. So excellent. Let's move to monitoring. So in monitoring, again, they're forecasting somewhat because they haven't actually done this. They're, they're becoming aware. Now, I know some of you may, if you're more skeptical, you may be thinking, well, are students really doing this? This isn't a research instrument. The idea behind this is to get students to do these, but also is to plant the seed of awareness in their mind. And I'll show you the importance of awareness here in one of our latter slides here. But so students are thinking through about how they're going to do this because in reality, monitoring is an in vivo or live activity. It's where you're consciously aware of what you're doing while you're doing it. And so in response to question six, students are saying, I will supervise my thinking to make sure it's aligned with the required modes of thinking. Again, whether they do this completely isn't as important as the fact that they're actually doing it, that they're actually investing the time into thinking about how their thinking matches the outcomes. Number seven, I will adjust my thinking when appropriate, great. Great responses there. Number eight, I will use my metacognitive tools to help me think clearer and better. And you will see this, uh, students are actually commenting on this on the back end in some of the qualitative data that we have as well. Now let's move to evaluating. And we looked at two, two features, assessing the quality of one's thinking they've invested in their work and also being certain that they've used the appropriate thinking skills. 
So we might recall that whenever students do academic work, there's a period when they're going to assess, they're going to sort of do a mental checklist in their minds and say, hmm, is this sufficient? Typically, less metacognitively aware students will judge their learning based upon the more visible components. So if they're writing a paper, do I have the word link? Do I have the right uh, font? So, so on and so forth. But really when we're assessing students, students may get all of those visible features right, but oftentimes their paper still falls short. And that's because it's missing the, the, uh, the, the quality of thinking that we wanna see, that analysis isn't in there, that deep evaluative component of the writing isn't in there. Or if we're assessing them in a, in a multiple choice test or an essay, the same thing. So as you can see, these uh, fewer students did uh, rate it that they were able to do these. This is actually good news to me because it shows that they're taking this survey seriously, that these, res these reflect honest responses because this is a back end measure and students are likely saying that, you know, I'm not so sure I've done this yet. So in our subsequent months, we'll probably see that gap close and that'll indicate that students have gotten some feedback in the form of good grades, good uh, good um, assessment data back from you, and that will close that gap there a little bit if, if we're doing things right, which all indications show that you are. And then their response to the question is how has thinking metacognitively impacted your academic work in this course, in the particular course that is being introduced? You can see some of their responses. And on Saturday, we went over this, uh, what these mean, and in terms of the, the unhelpful, some of you were wondering what that meant. So as you saw in the raw data that I sent you all, that this simply entails students are saying, you know, well, I don't know yet because it's, it's, I'm spending a lot more time doing this than I otherwise would. So that, that's, that's what those numbers reflect. But that, that, that could be a good thing. It's just students are going to be at different places in their academic journey. And so those students will likely move up to this helpful, um, this helpful cohort later. And then here's their response to the other question, which was, how has thinking metacognitively impacted your academic work in other courses thus far? And I love the responses to this question because as I've always said, you know, at every school I work with, I feel so sad for students because everybody's trying to give them strategies or tactics for sciences and tactics for humanities and tactics for pre-professional courses and this tactic for this task and so on and so forth. And students are just weighed down with all of these different tactics. And you have to be, you know, <laughs> they're, they're trying to navigate all these different things in addition to trying to learn the content. And it really shouldn't be like that. And so one of the things that separates metacognition in the research is that researchers call metacognitive skills domain surpassing. And that's just a fancy term for saying that when students learn metacognitive skills, they're portable. And as you see, even though you all didn't emphasize how these may work in other courses, because metacognition deals with how to learn in general, not specific to any course, students automatically see the benefits in other courses and they automatically transfer those skills and leverage them in other courses, as you can see here. So great, 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 great work there. So that means that you all are doing a good job. And lastly, I just want to share, when I look at this, I'm pulling out and deducing some of the research that I see playing out in students' comments. And here are some of those terms that come to mind about what students are doing. And, and I'll show you some other more common research terms here as we end. So again, we've seen what you're, what you're doing and how what you're doing is impacting what students are doing directly. And that is what I talk about, are creating that complementary learning environment so that everybody's working together and there's symmetry and synergy amongst faculty and students. So great, great job. Now, that's where we are. We'll, we'll meet again in about a month, but so I wanna share some things about what to be doing between now, here we are on March 2nd, all the way through um, we meet again at the latter part of March. Use this tool that you should see on your screen here. Let me scroll down. I apologize for scrolling on you, but the metacognitive toolkit that you all have. Tactics and tools for creating effective thinkers and deep learners. Now that you've been through this training on the Think Well Learn Well diagram and these tools, you can now use 
these tools effectively. And some of you already have. For example, as I scroll again, this table of contents, um, I just wanna bring this up. I'm not gonna go into the pages to take up time here because you all have this resource, but this first one, investigating the course title, I'd love when uh, I believe it's Dr. McCarty was saying that in her theater management courses, when she used this tactic, students began to say, you know, this course title doesn't actually fully uh, capture what we're doing in this course. What we're doing in this course actually exceeds the title. That level of understanding and investment in figuring it out is tremendously helpful uh, for students. I mean, that is something that is very valuable and it shows that they are thinking about the course in a different way as, as uh, Dr. McCarty mentioned. Continue using these, <clears throat> excuse me, go ahead and use some of these uh, tools down here. I won't point out any because all of them are excellent. Just depends on the conditions that you're facing in your class and where your students are. But right now you should be in a phase since you've embedded this infrastructure in your students. You've built this capacity within them to think properly and to learn effectively for your course. Now you've done the hard work. Now your job is to reinforce it strategically. So it's at different points, reinforce those thinking, the thinking uh, elements of the course, and then to remind students, trigger them by saying, hey, remember this, we have an upcoming test. Remember this kind of thinking is really gonna be reflected on the test. So all of those things, uh, that we discussed um, in our Saturday session and in our pr previous sessions. Now I'm gonna share this split screen with you because I wanna situate what students are doing and where they are with where you are in your class and what you can expect. So as you can see right here, this is called the Good Student to Great Learner transformation, transformation Process. And it's just a process that you can expect students to go on and you all are already seeing. So it starts with metacognitive awareness. Research suggests that humans engage in metacognitive activity from age three. So that means that by the time students are in college, they've accumulated a lot of metacognitive activity. Unfortunately, they aren't aware of it. And so they can't take advantage of it. And that's why their grades and their performance suffers and the classes are less interesting and so on and so forth. So we always wanna start from metacognitive awareness, just making students aware of this. And then we want to strategically move them toward metacognitive control. And many of you have the, 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 the um, comments that you shared indicate that students are on this path. So let me show you where they are. Stage one, unconscious usage. Students are, students, um, student is unaware of the skill usage. That's where students start, right? They're not even aware of this metacognitive stuff. Now through you giving them information and then the utility showing them how metacognition is useful and applicable to their academic uh, goals and their desire to perform well or work less or whatever it may be, um, that is going to move them to stage two. And that is conscious incompetence. I know Dr. Clark, you mentioned that that's where your students are. And that's great. That's a, that you can get there in one day sometime, one session. Um, and then that's when students are aware of metacognitive, what their metacognitive activity, but they aren't able to use it yet. It's just, oh, okay, I see this, but I'm not skilled enough to, to actually exploit it. Then through training and feedback, which is what you all have been giving them and what you're going to continue to do, training on how to use the diagram, modeling the thinking skills, feedback on work that they turn in, group discussions, online journal entries, giving them that explicit metacognitive feedback, you're gonna move them into stage three, which is called conscious competence. And that's when students are doing this now, they recognize they're doing this, but it has high levels of concentration, they have to focus on it. And based upon the students uh, survey uh, feedback, you can see that many students are here. They're saying, I see the benefits of this now, this is really useful. So I feel like if you get students there, you've done a good job and, and now it's up to students through, the, through practicing the skills that they've learned, using the tools that you've given to them and their own experience using their metacognitive powers, I like to call it superpowers, then they can move into unconscious competence. And that is when it's second nature. They're just doing it automatically. And that's a great place for students. They learn faster, they learn better, 
they can go deeper and they enjoy the classes a lot more. And some of this is they're starting, we're starting to see glimmers of this in their responses, even a month into this. So some of you have mentioned that this has been somewhat of a load for you in the beginning. And you might remember I shared with this, you, I shared this slide with you earlier is that what happens is you're putting forth a lot of effort. You're building this infrastructure in the course, in your students' minds, so that later on, they'll be able to do the type of work that you need them to do. So yeah, so you are doing more work here. But as some of you have indicated, uh, what happens is you're able to decrease your efforts to some degree because students have upped their skills, meaning that they have the capacity to do more better at this point. And ultimately your class is gonna hit an inflection point. And that is where all of a sudden this transfer happens to where now your work changes, your effort, and that's probably not the best word to describe that, decreases, but what happens is you move to more of a facilitator's role. You move to more of a cheerleader role. And now students are doing the lion's share of the work. And one explicit great example of this is when I believe it's uh, Samuel or Sam from Livingstone, when you said that, you know, for the first time in your teaching career, a group of male students stayed after, had been staying after class to continue engaging in deep discussions about the material that you all are covering. So what's happening is now because they have this deep thinking skills, they have this lens through which they can see the material as deeply as you do. And that changes the discourse as you mentioned in your comments. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned is that now these students are coming up with additional assignments separate from what you're assigning them to do that they think they need to do in order to continue to learn this at a deeper level. That is exactly what happens here. So now you're, as you mentioned, you're having to go and find things and help them do these assignments. You're facilitating these assignments that they generated and now they are on this path here. And that's a fun place for educators because that's what I think educators envision their courses being like. It's much more invigorating for faculty, as you mentioned, some of you mentioned with your uh, that you're experiencing. And then also is much more rewarding for students because they take this capacity that you've built and they take that into other courses. So great job, great examples of how you all are using these skills, so proud. And I have just one more slide to share and then um, I'm gonna share a little bit of a few clips um, from the uh, Saturday session that are I think salient that will be good for you to sort of uh, ruminate over here in uh, over the month. So I want to end with a few research terms that you may be familiar with, because for me, when I'm doing this with students, I love seeing the concrete examples, but I'm also pulling out of that and um, um, inducing that up or to the actual research that it talks about. So what we're seeing is self-efficacy at play. As students understand the appreciation of their knowledge, where they are, the understanding with clarity of the learning task, and they have the knowledge and skills in place to think this way through due to the metacognitive elements you've added to your course and the tools they've been given, they're developing their self-efficacy. They're seeing their ability, their belief in their ability to perform at high levels in the work that you're doing. The second thing is this uh, locus of control. Because they have this clarity and this precision of their work, Locus of control deals with the degree of agency that students bring to their work. And generally students come with an external locus of control. And what that means is they believe that there's only so much they can do to control the outcomes of their work. And the rest of it is up to you. So if they get a bad grade, they will say, oh, well, you know, um, you know, the teacher didn't teach it well or whatever, so on and so forth. But because you're embedding these, these explicit metacognitive elements to your course, students are switching to an internal locus of control, which is directly linked to metacognition. And so now those students are saying, oh, no, 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 no. There are some things that I can do to directly influence and impact my academic performance and my learning and so forth. And that gets to self-regulation, their ability to plan, 
monitor and evaluate their thinking is going to be huge. It's paying dividends now. It's paying dividends not only in your course, but in other courses, and it's going to continue paying dividends um, throughout their academic career. This is going to be a force multiplier. And what I mean by that is I've always said metacognition, I call it a superpower, or for, for a more academic scientific term, it's a force multiplier, meaning that when students learn when students gain metacognitive competence, it cascades throughout their entire academic career. Um, and so you're, you're seeing the fruits of that right now. And then lastly, I like to, I like to share this is that, that metacognition is directly tied to student success, quality education, because now you can have deep academic rigor, although I hate using that term, so I'll say cognitive complexity, meaning you can require students to engage in these complex mental functions and also transferable education. Because metacognition also, these skills are also valuable in the workplace and are distinctive in the workplace, that students who have these great metacognitive skills, we can expect them to also advance at a much further and faster rate than they otherwise would um, with these metacognitive skills. And that's what the research uh, shows. So again, I'm gonna end with a few clips from you all uh, from Saturday, but I just wanna let you all know that you're doing an excellent job, continue doing the work. You've done a lot of the hard, heavy lifting. Now enjoy the fruits of your labor by reinforcing and reminding students of these thinking skills and, and um, having them use the tools that you've provided them. So until we get together next time, continue doing the work. And as I always say, if students think well, they learn well, and they perform well. So good job. I've been really excited this semester because unwittingly, I found the engagement of these metacognitive practices and some of the examples and exercises that we were doing being very helpful in my own um, courses. Um, I'm teaching a freshman course that's a continuation and a senior course that's a continuation out of our um, Apple Regional Hub initiative, Everyone Can Code, Everyone Can Create. And that is not the class that I use, that I anticipated utilizing um, these metacognitive strategies and my, the course I was focused on was my intro to the African-American experience. And I, was, I, was, I was very concerned about whether or not they have the capacity to give constructive feedback reflectively utilizing the rubric without condemnation and shame, you know, because we're developing them um, as first year. Well, they came back with excellent feedback and they reflected on their own learning. They reflected on the assessment of not their grade. They reflected on the opportunities they missed to have had a better project as a result of engaging in the reflection of their own, of their, their peers. So I called Dr. Patterson because I was just like deliriously, off. I was just so, it was just a, such a great teaching moment. So I'm a believer. You're gonna see the work that you're doing pop up everywhere across your courses. It's showing up in my other courses because that was not my focus as a teacher. And I have the metacognitive checklist next to me to look at, to think about what types of questions do I need to ask or engage based on the questions that they have related to their learning. Focused on my theater administration class in terms of really exploring metacognition. But as others have said, when I got into it, I said, well, why wouldn't I be really exploring this in other classes too. So they are, I feel that they're doing pretty well about thinking more deeply about their work. And I'm having a lot of fun and I think that they are as well. And I think they're seeing the linkage between what they're doing and what the expectation is. I do see that students are able to understand and differentiate between the terminology much more effectively than in previous semesters, so I'm very much encouraged by that. We're not at the inflection point. I would say that we are probably in stage two conscious incompetence, right? So they know what it is, um, but they haven't quite grasped, like they haven't quite translated the knowledge of what it is into what they're actually doing yet. Instead of just sort of plunging ahead, 
um, I'm trying to create an environment where we reflect on what we are doing and um, it seems to be working well and students appreciate it. Um, students have said that they appreciate uh, thinking about thinking and that that the things that they're realizing in this class, they're applying to other classes. And it was amazing to see how all of a sudden there was this competition on who could actually, you know, write really high order thinking questions. And they were able to see based on what they did initially without it. And then with it, how they were able to um, really create more complex questions, if you will. So that has um, worked out really well. And also with the rewritten MLOs that um, we did near the end, um, I found that um, students are able to, I think now they're much more aware of how it is that they they can achieve whatever the, the goals or student learning outcomes are for the semester or the class, I should say. So I think that um, overall it's going okay, I would say, very optimistically. Um, so I think that this this PD has helped me with um, being more intentional in my practices, right? So I used to create assignments that I kind of felt like I wanted to meet the learning outcome, but I wanted to be interactional and fun. And I didn't realize that I could still achieve those things, but be a lot more strategic in what I'm doing. So um, building students towards that deeper understanding of the material. I am overjoyed. Now, this is something that I haven't seen in the four or five years I've been at Livingstone. Um, students staying after class to talk about the content. 